Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. As you'll notice, I'm in my brand new uh, artificial intelligence studio. Uh, the last interview I did with Larry Wilkerson, I got so many complaints about uh, how everything looked, uh, justly so. Uh, I did something about it. Uh, so I hope this is uh, at least an improvement. Joining me in just a few seconds will be Larry Wilkerson. Uh, we're going to talk about the election results. Don't forget, there's a donation button you can click. Uh, if you're on YouTube, please subscribe. Although most of our subscribers are all con constantly complaining that YouTube never notifies them of a new video and continues to try to suppress what we do. Uh, the best way to watch this is on the website at theanalysis.news. So if YouTube takes down any of our videos, which they have done in the past, uh, we have other ways to feed the website, so uh, you'll always get to see us there. We'll be back in a few seconds with Larry Wilkerson. So now joining us to talk about the uh, uh, election results in the United States, uh, which is a beginning of a, a new era of uh, a return, it was that back to the future uh, now joining us is Larry, who doesn't need any introduction to uh, our uh, normal viewers and to most people who follow the news. Thanks for joining us, Larry. Good to be with you, Paul. All right, so let's let's talk about what happened. Uh, so I'm blown away, I guess, at what an awful campaign the leadership of the Democratic Party uh, conducted. I, it wasn't something I said once I saw the results. I was saying it all through the campaign. Uh, Kamala Harris simply would not answer in any straightforward way almost any real question, but particularly the most important economic question. Uh, she would not answer, why is inflation coming down, but the cost of living is not on the whole, especially food and rent and other basic necessities. She never answered why that's happening, and she never said what she would do about it. Uh, there's some talk about uh, price gouging, but she actually never said how she would stop that and more or less stop talking about that as the campaign came to its conclusion. And, and the, the most, most important things that need to be talked about, the existential threats facing America, facing the world, uh, the climate crisis, almost not a, a word, and the uh, issue of uh, the threat of nuclear war. In fact, the only person to mention it at all, really, was Trump. And only when he's talking about his crazy uh, Iron Dome proposal to create a new anti-ballistic missile system, which we'll talk about as we get into the interview. Um, so uh, in the course of this, let's talk about uh, these three things I'd like to talk about. But first, just your basic reaction, and then we can get into these three areas. Frankly, I was stunned by the results. And not because I wasn't watching the polls, I was, but I don't trust the polls anymore. They're too much uh, aligned with the interests that back them. But I was stunned by the fact that so many Americans are apparently so dissatisfied with their country and with everything that's happening around them, that they're willing to go to the polls and vote for a chief uh, executive who is clearly, obviously, without any doubt whatsoever, even in the stupidest person's mind, a crook and more. Um, that's what stunned me most of all, was that the margin was significant, in my view, given the polls and given what I thought was going to happen. Significant enough to where there was there will be, I don't think, any debate uh, or any real court cases or anything. Trump has won both the Electoral College and the popular vote. That's shocking to me. I knew America was in trouble. I knew we were having enormous domestic problems. I knew those problems were translating into foreign policy and foreign policy into domestic problems. I mean, it's, they feed each other. And I knew we were at a point where, as I've said many times, the empire is looking very shoddy and as if it were approaching some denouement, some end. But I didn't think we'd come to the point where we'd elect Donald Trump as president again. And we did. The uh, campaign made a strategic decision. Um, unlike Biden, uh, when he ran, and I guess Biden because Sanders had had such a strong primary campaign. Uh, Biden uh, created a platform committee or working group with Bernie Sanders and ran to the left of center 
and and beat Trump with a campaign somewhat to the left of center. Uh, the Harris campaign gave up, not gave up, uh, hated the left really, uh, and mm. spent all its focus on trying to shave off Republican votes uh, or center right votes, and barely mentioned the climate crisis had mealy-mouthed responses on economic questions and and uh, lost. So uh, what do you make of that? That, that? that that the campaign had no substantive guts to it. I would say that probably right now, knowing myself personally how spiteful Joe Biden can be and thinking that in his elder years, he's become even more so, that he's crowing right now about her being so defeated. That's his first and personal reaction. His professional and political reaction is, oh, God, what did we do? And he's probably thinking, uh, if I'd stayed the candidate, this wouldn't have happened. Yeah, there might be some evidence for that. Uh, nonetheless, it's happened. And I think, the, as I said before, as I tried to imply anyway, I think this is more a comment on America and the state of the empire than it is a comment on either candidate or party or the political process in general, though they aided and abetted this denouement. Um, I think we're in trouble, Paul. I think we're in deep trouble economically, financially, culturally. I think we are poised on the brink of a potential domestic collapse as well as a foreign policy collapse, if you will. Um, and that's a recipe for in our world, I think, we aren't the British. We aren't the kind of people who can absorb this loss over a 70 year period and come out of it on the other end, still clicking somewhat. We're the kind of people that go down catastrophically. We're the kind of empire that goes down catastrophically. And I'm seeing the signs and I'm seeing the telltale uh, indications that we have seen our day in the sun, and unlike previous empires of a, a similar wealth and breadth and power who managed to hold on for a hundred years after clearly the rot had set in, I don't think we're going to hold on that long, N not just because of the decay that's happened, but also because of the conditions around us that are making this happen externally. Um, they aren't going away. They're going to deepen, they're going to widen, and they become more powerful. And of course, we're throwing uh, fuel into that deepening, widening, and becoming more powerful against us. We're actually helping it. So this could be very sudden and very traumatic and very destabilizing, nationally destabilizing. The, uh, the I mean, the, thing, the fundamental structural issue uh, is the incredible concentration of wealth that's happened over the last decades. Yes. And, and now this election, I, I think more than any previous. And let me make just one point. Before you get away from that, let me say wealth that doesn't necessarily like us. <laughs> <laughs> the, the billionaire class came out so openly in this election, particularly on the Republican side with Musk and people like Peter Thiel and others. But of course, the Democrats have their, their own billionaires uh, and, and the billionaire class overtly fought each other, decided who would be the president and have elected, uh, they, uh, talking about a new king, I think it's better to say a new emperor. And I was reading somewhere, they, they, they've elected Nero. Uh, you know, this yeah. is the guy who's going to fiddle as the earth burns. And the billionaires have just decided that uh, they're going to go, you know, they're in this crazy metaphysical uh, space, whether it's Peter Thiel and the far right Christians who are doing God's work and want to start a new crusade to save uh, Judeo Christian civilization, or you have Musk who wants to start uh, civilization on Mars. Uh, I mean, these guys are living in some cr in crazy cuckoo land and the, the most critical issue of climate crisis and threat of nuclear war is not even being talked about. If you want to really be shocked, <laughs> I started about a year ago collecting everything I could get my hands on. I have some people helping me with this on the climate crisis. Every kind of scientific article, every I've got headings like hurricanes, tornadoes, rain, you know, and, and all of the 
pieces that have come out, scientific journals and such, and just New York Times, Washington Post, and others occasionally in there. And when I go over it, I've now got over a thousand articles in it. And when I go over it and look at the headings alone, but then read some of the headings, like, for example, geoengineering, and go down through geo geoengineering and see the crazy ass things that are going on right now, funded by many of these billionaires inadvertently or indirectly, I should say, or directly, and threaten us as much as the climate crisis. And it's going on. And maybe the LA Times picks it up if it's happening in California. Maybe the New York Times picks it up if it's happening on the East Coast. Maybe my climate and security working group picks it up if it, if it has real national security implications. Um, but no one's really talking about this. No one's congealing it and saying, look at all the things that are going on right now that not only corroborate that we are in deep shit, but also show the morons out there who are putting tons of money behind methodologies that won't do a thing except waste their money, waste people's times, and maybe are dangerous. It's really shocking when you go through the list. The uh, extent to which the billionaires backed an openly uh, campaign for Trump, uh, Musk and others, uh, but it, it's clear how the Harris campaign was tailored not to offend big donors, meaning they're billionaires. There's no way to explain Harris's position on Gaza. I mean, not to let it, this, the Palestinian woman legislator speak at the Democratic Convention. I mean, a small token, they, her campaign, Harris wouldn't even do that because it would piss off uh, some of the donors that are so pro-Israel, uh, pro, pro-Israeli genocide. Um, and on the issue of climate change, she, uh, f they're terrified to piss off the fossil fuel companies. She has to go pro fracking in Pennsylvania. Uh, and even if you're going to pander to the only around half of people of Pennsylvania that want fracking, you could at least actually talk about a just transition and tell the people of Pennsylvania, listen, we got to get off fossil fuel. Maybe you'll frack right now. I'm not saying I'm for fracking, but I'm saying she could have argued this. But you don't have to bear the burden of this alone. You know, the whole country's benefited from fossil fuel. So if we're getting off it, the whole country has to help people of Pennsylvania and other states that, that depend on fossil fuel to have a just transition to sustainable energy. None of that. And it's not like they don't know that argument. Well, you've just outlined a, a major incentive um, that I've noticed uh, for the past decade in particular of politicians of whatever party or stripe, even independents like Angus King, and their inability or lack of willingness to tackle the tough issues because they think the politics divide evenly or are enormously against them, like APAC and the billionaires that fund it. Um, they just don't have the courage to take it on. We we have a courageless legislative branch. They shout and scream like Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham and Josh Hawley and that guy from Louisiana, Kennedy. They try try to make themselves look smart. They're making themselves look like the biggest cowards on the face of the earth. There's not a single one of them that will tackle any of these problems. And it's mainly because of what you just described. It has either balanced political implications, and they don't want to touch it because they can't get it on one side or the other with a majority, or it has enormously for them in their position negative implications. So no courage, no tackle tough problems. Now, if anyone's going to say, why am I spending my time trashing the leadership of the Democratic Party? Uh, in, in this interview, and let me explain for two reasons. One, listen to everything I've been saying the last few months and watch our video, uh, the uh, Trump's Unholy Alliance. I've spent a lot of time uh, tr you know, critiquing, and for the next four years, I'll, I'll mostly be critiquing, critiquing the Trump administration. But I think the, uh, the inability of the leadership of the Democratic Party, the people that ran the Harris campaign, and, and obviously Harris herself, but she seemed to be uh, almost like an actor uh, performing a script that had been prepared for her by some kind of marketing company. Um, but the, very close uh, to the truth, probably. I, I think so, because she had her talking point. She was very disciplined, and it didn't matter what anybody asked her. She would go back to it. Like somebody would ask her about what are you going to do about high prices? And she would talk about growing up in a working class family. Um, it, it just never made any sense. 
Um, but the reason I'm focusing on that, because as dark and uh, dangerous as I believe the Trump administration will be, and I think people that consider themselves supposedly on the left or progressive or something that somehow thought, thought or think this is a good thing Trump wins, I think they're completely nuts. But I do think how discredited the Democratic Party leadership is now, um, how uh, impotent they were, um, is, a, is an opening. So if there's any silver lining in, in this, and, and I'm not trying to uh, diminish how dangerous the Trump administration is going to be, but there is an opportunity here now for a broad, progressive, united, democratic front of people to do what Trump did to the Republican Party, but do it to the Democratic Party. Take the thing over at every possible local level, whether it's city or whether it's states. Um, the, the, the Democratic Party has to be in disarray right now. Um, and, uh, you know, some people are, I just saw Adam McKay, who was the, did that great film, The Big Short, the film director said he's done with the Democratic Party. Uh, he wants to join, he's going to talk about the Greens or something. I don't, I'm not, I don't think so. I think actually now's the time to take advantage of, of how weak and, and dis, uh, disorganized the Democratic Party is going to be and, and try to really primary the hell out of these uh, right-wing Dems on both climate, because they're afraid of fossil fuel money, uh, on, on Gaza, because they're afraid of pro-right-wing uh, Israeli money, uh, they were left with nothing as a campaign, except, you know, she smiled and had a campaign of, of joy. But I don't think anyone's feeling the joy uh, right now. Well, you make some sense there, I think, uh, in, a, in a very real way, because for well, climate change, for example, I think the admonition I got from the senator some years ago, now it must be a decade almost ago, when I confronted him on the national security implications, a Texas senator, of all things. and he. Listen to my pitch because the Iowa senator, Joni Ernst, had set me up with him because she had just listened to my pitch, even though she's not really in the ballgame either. And he said to me, when it's 16 feet of water in Wall Street, we'll react. <laughs> well, I think we're coming to a point where the climate is going to do that sort of thing all across the country and the globe. Military's all well seized of this. They know what's coming. And they are just shuddering about the prospects of their humanitarian assistance and disaster relief budget dwarfing everything else, including new weapons acquisition and such. And once that hits, then you've got the impetus and you've got the political space and political motion, if you will, to do something about this that won't be antagonistic with your voters, because they're going to be in the water. So why did, but, but why didn't they do it? Like, you know, Trump says, God save me. It just hit my ear. It was a message from God. Well, how about the hurricanes that hit Florida? Yeah. Why wasn't that the time to People go are to Florida still, and say, this is the climate crisis? People are still saying, this is just a bad period. This is just this isn't the climate crisis, bang bang. This is just a bad period of weather. We've had bad period of weathers before. And there's a, some justification for that. You have to dig into the data and you have to see how the data is the same year after year after year, getting worse and worse and worse. Whether it's the 3.5 that we now pretty much are sure we're going to hit by mid-century and really go out of the realm of possibility of survival for a long term after that, if we do do that. And we're going to do that. We're certainly going to do that. Well, we're rent, we've, we've already hit the one five, which the Paris yeah. Accords was supposed to stop. And uh, yeah. and now we've elected a climate science denier. Yes. Going and to a fossil fuel everything. lover. Drill, yes. baby, drill. Yeah. Uh, once, once this, I'm afraid, as I implied in my earlier remarks, I'm afraid that this is going to get so bad. Take the senator's metaphor, for example, it's going to be 28 feet of water in Wall Street <laughs> that we are going to be unable to recover, and that that inability, whether it's real or perceived, is irrelevant 
the American people will be distraught and, you know, at each other's throats and we'll have battles over these things. You you had tornadoes in Oklahoma yesterday that pretty much wiped out the state. One will say to another, the other will say, well, look at what I had in Oregon or Washington state. And we'll have all this contention across the country about anybody doing anything about it that is significant and worthwhile. One reason why I, me and some other people are trying to build a whole database right now of people, spatial epidemiologists, emergency medical people, water experts, flood experts, damage control experts, refugee law lawyers, refugee camp managers, all these things we're looking at, over 100 skills we're looking at, to put together in something like FDR, CCC, call it a climate crisis core, if you will. But we're looking at having to conscript or whatever, maybe somewhere between 10 and 15 million people. Um, and when you think, well, that's preposterous. We had 140 million in 1941, and we conscripted over 12 million. So it's not a huge amount of our population. And they're going to have to comprise this climate change core that's going to have to act. And we're not talking about going overseas with it. We're talking about doing domestic tasks that fit these skill sets from fighting fires to fighting floods, because it's gonna get that bad. And, and as far as running refugee camps on the borders, I mean, our simulations showed that in 2050, 2060, we're running huge 100,000 plus people refugee camps all along our Southern borders. And then we tire of it. After a decade, we tire of it and we put troops on the borders and shoot people. Now that's a worst case scenario, but that's what we're looking at. It's very dangerous to get to that point though. It may be the point of no return. We may not have any alternatives after that. We may be in chaos. We may be fighting each other in the streets. Um, we're trying to do our best to get enough people involved who understand this. And I must say, most of these people are under 40. Most of these people are under 40. They get it. They understand what's happening and they understand the national security implications. If we don't do something significant, I mean, forget about nuclear weapons, the climate will wipe us out even if we're able to control the absolute insanity that reigns right now about nuclear weapons. And the ABM treaty that he's talking about, this, the, uh, not, not a treaty. Not treaty. Yeah, <laughs> a deal. yeah, I wish you were talking about a treaty. Yeah. That's, that's, the, uh, that's just the last straw. We've already got this, you know, Ted Postal talks about this all the time. We've already got this improvement in our murdered warheads that allows them now to present the president of the United States with a first strike capability, even a capability to so denude the opponent in that first strike that they might think about doing it intentionally. So you throw some kind of shield into this too, even if it's only half-assed, like the Israeli Iron Dome is well, only- it has, to, it has to be half-assed. The, yeah. There's no, there is no shield that's gonna stop ICBMs coming out of the sky. This is you got this that. Is, this is which Israel it, has discovered. Yeah, and the Israeli thing can deal with ballistic missiles that are you know flying more or less straight over, and maybe they go up a little bit and down, but they're not intercontinental ballistic missiles. And they're not coming down at thirty-three thousand kilometers an hour. And they're not coming down surrounded by thousands of decoys. I mean, the whole thing's yeah. total nonsense. The only thing yeah. that makes sense about the Trump Iron Dome is if you're Elon Musk and Peter Thiel, you will make a shitload of money out of this boondoggle. Precisely, precisely what Lockheed Martin did off of Thad and other elements of the existing shield material. They made tons of money off South Korea, tons of money off Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states by selling them this very expensive equipment that probably will hit one out of 10. The The... There's an underlying strategic thing that seems to pervade everything, and it's not just on the Republican side. It's very much amongst the uh, billionaires and leaders of the Democratic Party, too, although it's more aggressive on the Republican Trump side. Everything seems to start and end with how to defeat China. Um, you know, the drill baby drill thing isn't just about pleasing fossil fuel companies. It's about having some strategic advantage against China. Uh, th this, the, the idea that if there's going to be a legitimate climate uh, 
plan, there's got to be cooperation with China. Well, they don't want cooperation with China. Nope. They want to somehow assert, reassert American hegemony in the world. And I mean, I don't, they're not going to succeed, but that's the plan. And it's a very, it's a major detriment, if not a showstopper, to a nuclear weapons treaty regime that might curb some of this and get us back into a relatively sane world with respect to those heinous weapons. I mean, we're looking at both of those things, the climate crisis and nuclear weapons, and they require cooperation and collaboration, not animosity. You can have strategic competition economically and so forth, but you, you can't have this animosity and deal with these two uh, challenges that the world has because they are global challenges. They are not a challenge to the state of America or the state of China. Here's a scary thing, Paul. I'm hearing talk that because we're up to 22 million barrels a day now, dwarfing even combined Russia and China production, because of that, we're actually considering that we could go ahead and allow the Israelis to strike the oil facilities in the Persian Gulf and weather the storm and get it over with, take out Iran and get it over with. Um, I don't know if that was on the National Security Advisor to Mohammed bin Salman uh, on his mind when he just concluded his visit and apparently inked a bilateral treaty. Remember, we're going to have a multilateral treaty, including Israel. No, a bilateral treaty was inked between him and the administration here for defense of Saudi Arabia. We've already done that uh, under different names, but they're basically bilateral treaties with Qatar, with Bahrain, and with the Emirates. So we're obviating the GCC now, the Gulf Cooperation Council, and doing these bilateral treaties. Was the conversation that Jake Sullivan had with his counterpart from Saudi Arabia a couple of days ago, did that involve this? It, I can't imagine that Saudi Arabia is going to accept their own facilities being counterstruck by Iran and, you know, some really productive capacity going on. But it wouldn't bother us, not for, not for a while. Now, I've got news for them. If, if 20 percent of the world's oil, maybe not the U.S., but the world's oil, including Japan and others, goes through the Strait of Hormuz and stops, I've done the war game. Uh, in Beijing in 2009, we did the war game, the simulation, we called it. Oil goes to $300 a barrel overnight. Insurers will not insure and shippers will not ship. We had to send half the American Navy to the Gulf before we, and that was a couple of weeks it took to quell those rising oil prices, and they didn't stabilize very well. They stabilized around 170 and that's very disruptive. We actually had to move, and the Chinese were in this game, the Japanese were in this game, the Koreans were in this game, Lloyds of London was in this game. Um, uh, what's the Maritime Commission was in the game. All these experts were there. We moved oil all around the world with global cooperation in order to quiet the markets, quiet the insurers, quiet the shippers, get things back on an even. We were shipping uh, essentially Alaskan oil to Korea. And Korea was shipping other things to Japan and Japan to Korea. We, we really mucked with the energy. Didn't, we didn't muck with it. We really redistributed the energy grid across the globe in order to deal with this crisis. That's how deep it was. So why would we be thinking about going ahead with an attack on Iran, authorizing Bibi to do it, him getting in deep kimchi, and then us, us following up with the so-called killer blow? I've got news for us there, too. It isn't going to be a killer blow. Um, but this is a development that could happen between now and inauguration. And I could just see the Biden administration leaving Trump with this kind of dilemma. That is to say, we're mired in a decision that has not quite been made yet as to whether or not we let Israel topple or we go in and help them. That would be a real kicker between now and January and the inauguration. Well, it would certainly... <laughs> serve Trump's interest if Biden were to do it, because yep. he can blame it on Biden, but it's not like it's not something Trump wants anyway. I mean, there was, Millie said Trump wanted to start something with Iran uh, as one of the things to stop the transition of power back in 21. Uh, the the right-wing forces around Trump, uh, they would love to see an attack on, on Iran. So I, I, I don't know whether 
Biden wants to make that part of his legacy of what what there is left of that legacy. Um, I do want to have any. Sorry, go ahead. You may not have any choice, though, if Netanyahu senses that he has to get himself in a real trick bag in order to entice the United States and what he's always wanted them to do. Well, he's already talked to Trump, hasn't he? And so, you know, if Trump says go ahead now, uh, yeah, he doesn't need Biden to say go ahead. He could put, yeah, you're right, he could put Biden in the corner. And Zelensky's talked to Trump too. Uh, That was kind of weird, at least the message that I got that he he delivered. Uh, Please support my victory plan or something like that. Well, Peter Thiel and uh, makes a, a lot of money. Uh, Palantir, Peter Thiel's company, is making lots of money in U- the Ukraine war, and uh, Musk is making lots of money with his Starlink. Uh, or he wanted, he's going to make lots of money. I don't know how much he's been paid yet, but he's expecting to get paid a lot. Um, so it's not like there isn't some uh, billionaire interest on the Trump side to keep the Ukraine war going, although they'd rather focus on China. This is one reason why I'm not so sure that all my compatriots who are saying, well, at least Trump will stop the Ukraine conflict are right. <laughs> I mean, that's the one thing I actually hope. You know, when Obama got elected, I said that I have a, only one real hope that there'll be something really different, and that is he'll be rational about Iran. And he was, and they came to this agreement yep. on uh, the nuclear agreement. Yep. If, I don't have any hope for the Trump administration, except one. I would like to see that war ended. There's other ways to fight the Russian occupation of of the uh, Eastern Ukraine if the people there wanna fight. And it doesn't have to be all out war and slaughter as it is. There's general strikes, there's all kinds of things that could be done if that's what people wanna do. Um, But I have no other hope for this administration that anything good will come out of it. I was going to say, I want to return uh, again to this issue. uh, People who are feeling deflated and depressed and overwhelmed by this result, and I certainly understand why, um, you know, take a few days to feel that and then let's get going. Because I, I want to say again, there is an opportunity here to uh, break the hold of the uh, wa- of the pro democratic party wall street uh, that that especially the harris uh, admit a campaign was so dependent on but so so was biden but maybe slightly less there was a little more pro union content there was a little more climate stuff in the biden administration um, a little more inclusive of the sander kind of forces uh, the Harris campaign simply ignored all of that. Um, but, but, but because of this kind of historic defeat and, and what's coming, which will be very draconian, uh, I, you know, what, what Trump said in his victory speech, you know, promises made, promises kept. Well, mass deportation, that's one of the promises. Getting rid of the leftist vermin, uh, that's one of the promises. Uh, what's coming is not going to be the first Trump term. And if it looks like they've got the trifecta and the whole of, you know, both houses, uh, look out what's coming. But in states that are controlled by the Democratic Party, and I would particularly point to Michigan, where there's a a, a sort of center centrist, center left governor, Uh, they control both uh, uh, houses of legislature. There's big union, UAW. In states that, even though Trump won, I guess, Michigan by a hair, but but where there's real power, uh, anti-Trump power, uh, people need to take advantage of this moment and really get organized. Uh, uh, In California, in New York, uh, Illinois, uh, take advantage because there's, there's a war coming and the people of the big cities that did not vote for Trump they are going to hate what's what's coming, and and there's there's an opening here where a mass movement maybe will emerge. I, I you know some people argued let's have Trump because it creates the possibilities for that. I don't think that was a reason to vote for Trump, but it mm-hmm. doesn't mean there wasn't some truth to it. And, and maybe there's an opportunity. So we got to get over feeling completely dismayed by all of this, and get organized. And, and, and no, let me just get let me just one more thing to get concrete about it. It can't all be done within the Democratic Party. There does need to be an independent political movement of some kind 
that makes its own decisions, its own plans, but does primary the hell within the Democratic Party out of uh, right-wing Democrats. I don't disagree with you, I, and I think it is an opportunity, but I, 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 for that specific purpose, a revitalization of the Democratic Party and a, a, a more balanced Democratic Party that accommodates its progressive wing and accommodates in, in more than just a perfunctory way, the Bernie Sanders wing, if you will. But I also think, and I, this is where my pessimism and, and even cynicism clicks in, that we're going to fight each other in the streets in this country. And Trump is going to relish that. Um, and he's going to, he said he's going to make the Department of Justice a wing of the executive branch. He said explicitly he doesn't believe it should be the American people's attorney general. It should be his attorney general. He's going to use the FBI and other instruments to oppress us if we object to what he's doing. I wouldn't be surprised in the first six months that he rounds up Puerto Ricans, for example, and puts them on boats, whether they're legal or illegal, and gets rid of them. He'll pick some group that he'll think his people will tell him is manageable, and he will be very demonstrative about the way he does this. That is going to challenge what I just said that he declared in the campaign he would do, but I think it's going to, the challenge is going to be answered on his side. He's going to own the FBI. He's going to own the Justice Department. He already owns the Supreme Court for most practical purposes. And he's going to own the Congress in a significant way. He's going to be majorly cowed by this. And so I'm waiting for this first move that he's going to make against immigrants to fulfill his campaign promise. And if it's successful, even moderately successful, even partially successful, he'll move on to the next group and the next and the next. That's going to cause chaos in this country, domestic chaos of the first order. I, I think you're right, but I, 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 I just want to return to this idea. You know, if there's fighting in the streets, the big cities are not pro-Trump. Yeah. The big cities are massively anti-Trump, even, even though he increased his vote a hair and, and a little I bit. I saw that in New York. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it in New York. Yeah. <laughs> he held his big riot there. <laughs> But, but when they start implementing this uh, far-right, theocratic, religious agenda, this ain't going to go over well in the big cities. Um, and, and even the mass deportations, I, I don't know how serious he is really about that. Corporate America needs all these illegal, uh, uh, quote-unquote, illegal migrants because it puts pressure on, downward pressure on wages ab across the board. Uh, it's hard to see they're really going to do that. Um, but they might do it in places that voted against Trump, but maybe they'll focus on those sorts of places. Uh, Latinos did. It, it may start out as just cosmetic numbers to show he's fulfilling his promises. But if he's successful, I think it'll become more than cosmetic. But, but one thing that the, the states that are controlled by, by the Democratic Party, if, if progressives, even center, center leftists, centrists, in those states, well, let's remember they have guns too. You know, they yeah, have, remember, they, remember the yeah. last time we had a real problem in this country, big, big problem that caused a lot of blood and a lot of casualties was when the states decided they didn't like things. <laughs> and whether they band together or not is really immaterial. You've got some pretty powerful states out there with pretty powerful militias and national guards. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, who don't like Trump? I don't know what the militias think, but but the but the political leadership are anti-Trump, and the legislatures, to a large extent, are anti-Trump and anti this far-right theocracy. Um, and uh, people need to understand that there's some real power there, and and the focus needs to be uh, electorally on the midterms, and the, the it's only two years away. Where the, if we have any. Well, I was that was my next sentence. I mean, promised uh, Trump did promise, my dear Christians, I love you, my Christians. Vote for yeah. me now, and you won't have to vote again in four years. Exactly. And I, I, I take that in all seriousness because, as I said in the video we did on, about this, and people should watch Trump's unholy alliance. It's even more pertinent now. Um, Peter Thiel and some of the other uh, far right billionaires that are connected with Opus Dei, the far right of the Catholic Church, the far right evangelicals, they don't want elections in four years. They, they want a monarchy. And Mark Cuban said that's what 
the billionaires uh, like Musk and others want. Um, you know, except they don't want doubt it for a minute. Don't doubt so, it. But but it's not a time to be completely deflated. It's a time to see this as a, a new stage where there's going to be a big struggle. But but and I, and and we need everyone needs to learn how to talk to people about climate, talk about the hypocrisy of of wrapping this Trump agenda in Christianity, uh, and and we need to get past the siloed media, which because most of the people that voted Trump, they only watch and hear media that reinforces the Trump message, and the only way to get around that. If you talk to people where you live, you talk to people in your union, in your church, and you go out and you, in a very organized way, knock on doors. You know, I've been talking to some friends in Michigan. We, we want to start a school for door knockers. People mm. need to be learn how to talk to people about these issues. Because, you know, mm. I, I know when people were out campaigning and knocking on doors now, they didn't knock on doors of people that might vote Republican. They only knocked on doors that they thought were going to vote Democrat to get them out to vote. Very yeah. little was actually done to persuade people, but that's yeah. understandable because the Harris campaign didn't have any bloody uh, substance to persuade people with. Yeah. Well, one of the first mantras of dictatorship is you take over the media. And, you know, look what Sheldon Adelson did for Bibi Netanyahu, for example. He bought most of the important newspapers around Tel Aviv and made them Bibi Netanyahu mouthpieces. Haaretz was about the only one that held out and is still holding out against that momentum. Um, we've had the same thing happen in this country, I think, to a certain extent. So you're right. It has to be a grassroots level, grass tops level, whatever you want to call it that gets out there and spreads this message and communicates. And the power is still in our federal system in the states. Now that has a recipe also for, you know, the repetition of 1859, 1860 type. But it also is the instrumentality, if you will, politically and organizationally that could turn, turn the country around. I don't think it's gonna happen. I think it's too monumental a task. I think it's too too complex. And we're too fragmented, but that's. I think just... it. Can, I think it can happen at some state levels, and, and if, if you can break through, for example, in Michigan, um, you, you know, the, the you know, Mao Zedong was wrong about a lot of stuff. He was right about a few things. He was right about <laughs> political power coming out of the barrel of a gun. I don't think he's wrong about that. He, he was right about his... nuclear weapons being an anathema. Yeah. They and another one, a, a, a spark can start a prairie fire. Maybe in one state, you could have a breakthrough that could really start something. I, you know, there's not going to be a great victory at the national level in any time soon. It, it's not out of the question in the midterms. You could at least take over one of the houses, uh, but, but a real breakthrough might happen at a state level. If it looks like that you could take over one of the houses in the midterms, I don't think they'll have them. Well, th that's certainly the question, but that will even increase pressure even more on yep. what's going to happen in some of the big states. As, as everybody knows, the, you know, if you take out fossil fuel from Texas and Oklahoma, say, the, the, the only states that produce much wealth in this country are the city the states with big cities and our anti-Trump. I mean, that's that's yeah, what, where the wealth of the country comes from. What you said earlier, it's not a clear demarcation, but it's certainly a demarcation. The cities versus the elsewhere. Uh, you want to call it rural. You want you don't call it the suburbs usually because now the suburbs are pretty much a part of the city. Maybe not wealth-wise and intellectually, but they more or less, I think, vote that way for what for different reasons. So you you could have the battle lines be rural America. That's not a really good term anymore, but other than big city America and big cities. And I think that's what many of these oligarchs detest is the big cities because the big cities have proven to be havens for the opposite party, the Democrats. And I'm talking about the oligarchs who support the, largely the Republicans. So we've got all the ingredients for domestic uh, conflagration. Well, there's, from... But the, uh, there's another side to that, which is 
we got to get out of the big cities. We who advocate these ideas, we got to get into the rural areas. We got to talk to people. Uh, it won't be very long. They'll shoot you. What's They'll that? shoot you coming up the wall. <laughs> well, I don't think so. I, I think. You know, we have a lot of people living in rural America that watch the analysis. I get lots of emails. You know, at least 20, 25 percent. It's not America. clean cut. Yeah, no, it's I not mean, clean cut. The people that can talk to rural America is progressive rural America. Yeah. And there's, there's lots of them. Same thing with yeah. evangelicals. At least 20, 25 percent of evangelicals did not. And they're, and they're hardcore uh, conservative Republican types, Trump supporters in some of the big cities, too. Exactly. And here's the other thing, and, and this is in looking ahead to the midterms and to the, the, what we need to do in terms of act, getting active to change the situation. I haven't seen the final numbers, but normally 30, 40 percent of people don't vote at all. Yeah. And, and they're mostly poor and mostly working poor. Yeah. Why the hell we need, you know, why does the Democratic Party doesn't focus on registration of the working poor who don't vote because they don't want that uh, giant awakened. It would change the character of the party, but that's exactly what has to happen. If I one of the things right. we do is wake up, organize, talk to the working poor who don't vote and get them out and vote and, and get them organizing. Um, and Trump's gonna, Trump's gonna do his best to declare them to declare them non-citizens and <laughs> deport them. <laughs> well, a lot of those, a lot of we, those we had that born. move in Virginia. You know, Yunkin, Yunkin did that in Virginia at the last minute. I thought the courts were going to stop him because of, for no other reason than it was last minute and so close to the election. All these roles had to be cleansed of those who might not really be eligible to vote because they are not even green card owners. And of course, the span of time in there that he covered meant that some of the people started at the beginning of that time and were citizens midway or fully through that time. And yet they were going to be included in that. Oh, well, you can cast a provisional ballot and we'll check later to see if you really were a citizen. And we got that happening in Virginia. We barely squeaked by in Virginia. Well, I know you have to go. It's, uh, it's, uh, you gave me an, a hard out and you're almost there. So let me just say to end this, uh, I'm going to try to do once a week or once every two weeks, an interview, a commentary, but it's all going to be along the lines of get over the despair. Let's get organized. Let's talk about what, what, how, to, how to face up to the urgency of the situation and uh, urgency re climate urgency uh, urgency in terms of threat of nuclear weapons nuclear war urgency uh, in terms of this uh, theocratic right wing dictatorship which is which is being formed right before our eyes um you want to have a, a last word there and then we'll, I'll let you no, go that, what you just described is the only rational way to come back at it i mean that's what we talked about last night for example with Medea Benjamin and Ann. Um, we have to fight. We have to fight back and we have to do it strategically and wisely, not stupidly. And I, and I think there's something in our relationship, you, Larry, and me, Paul, you volunteered to go to Vietnam and I was out in the streets protesting against the Vietnam War and we end up kind of in the same place. Yeah, and you were smarter than I. <laughs> <laughs> I. I was lucky to grow up in a family that gave rise to somebody who would protest the Vietnam War. Yeah. Uh, it was well, that's, completely that's random. A pertinent, that's a pertinent point because I grew up in a family where everyone had served. Uh, my father in World War II, my father-in-law in World War II, and their parents before them had served, my grandfather on one side. So it was just a thing to do. Well, I think, well, so it's very hopeful, I think, how you and I can talk about what needs to be done. And anyone watching this, uh, wants to get in on this conversation about what we need to do and, and get over the despair and get organized, uh, write, comment, maybe we'll do some of these live. Uh, you know, people can talk, uh, let us know how you'd like to proceed uh, or you, how we at the analysis uh, can, can help this process. Thank you very much, Larry. Thanks for having me, Paul. And thank you everybody for watching the analysis.news and please uh, remember uh, the donate button, uh, this, we can't do this for free. Bye-bye. Uh,